Yeah. Oh, this is going to be another tough edit, isn't it? I can feel it. I can feel it. It'll be alright. It'll be alright. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Revolutionary Dispatches with me, Chris Wright. And me, David Bryan. Yeah, apologies for the lack of episode last week. David was on a boat. Yep, <laughs> you can blame Charles for that. I, I very much do. <laughs> and what can I say? It was really fun. <laughs> Living up to his top-hatted persona as the most middle-class socialist since at least Clement yeah. Hanley. If not actually Friedrich Engels. <laughs> But I've never owned anything as expensive as a factory. <laughs> no, I've you're never not, you're owned not, anything no. profitable. That makes me not bourgeois. That is true. No bourgeois scum for you. Yep. <laughs> right. It's been a busy couple of weeks. Um, yes. In good ways and bad. Mostly bad. That's better than normal. It's usually just bad. Well, there, yeah. There's been some interesting political developments, but also some very, some very sad events which we will get to. Yes. Um, yeah. But to, to kick us off with something that's not quite as sombre, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, French legislative election. Hmm. As many of you listening to this podcast may know, uh, the French presidential election uh, was held on the 23rd of April and the 7th of May, and despite fears that the Front National, the fascist party candidate Marine Le Pen would win that election and take over power in the country. In fact, she polled only 33.9% in the second round and won only two departments, which is still a little horrifying. Mm. Uh, but with 66% of the vote, Emmanuel Macron stormed to victory uh, and was elected president. Um, we've now just had the legislative election for the French National Assembly and again uh, Macron's party um, well movement turned party really which is called uh, Le Republique en Marche apologies for my butchering <laughs> of the French there but I don't speak French so yeah they they won in the second round 48.93% of the votes and 350 seats yeah I'm not I'm not entirely clear what the um, the electoral system for the for the legislative election in France is, so I don't know why they have two rounds. I believe, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same as the presidential election. Oh, right. So they but have single with... single member. Yeah, yeah, just with constituencies. So yeah, so they have two round first past the post electoral system with single member constituencies to be elected in the first round a candidate is required to secure an absolute majority of votes cast oh. and also to secure votes equal to at least 25% of eligible voters in their constituency so that's an interesting one so it means low turnout elections don't go through on the first round which is a good right. safeguard that is that's very sensible. I like that I like that uh, should should no one satisfy these conditions, a second round ensues. Only first round candidates with the support of at least twelve point five percent of eligible voters are allowed to participate. Um, except if only one candidate meets that standard, in which case the top two go through. In any case, um, in the second round, the candidate with the plurality, so the the greatest single number of votes, goes through. So it's slightly different to the presidential election in that, in theory, more than two parties can go through. Right. Per, per constituency, um, if they get at least twelve point five percent of eligible voters. Same basic idea, though. Um, but yeah, similar idea. And again, if you're willing to take the time to do it, quite a good system, I think. Yeah. I mean, it sort of approximates AV. Um, yeah, yeah. Which well, is, I think, I think the French have had it longer, so they've had it for. Yes. They've had it since it was impractical to do a proper AV system, so they actually yeah, do it in exactly. two rounds. Yeah, which um, it's it's a very good system. I've always liked the French presidential system in mm. particular. I like the fact that because you have the gap between rounds, it gives people a chance to sort of reconsider, if you like. Yeah, um, yeah. Which a, the on, the only disadvantage of AV, I think, relative to that, is that it, it, you know AV wants you to rate the candidates. That's it. Whereas this is is quite good because I mean you know after the first round, who's in position to yeah, win. Yeah. So the tactical voting can be, you know, if anything, even more tactical, yeah. which you may think is a good or bad thing. But That's something that um, keeps coming up with the uh, the mayoral elections that we have here. So the, for the mayor of London, the mayor of Greater Manchester and whatever, is that they have a two-round system as well. But 
people basically have to guess. It's a two-round system like the French presidential system, but it's not done on two different dates. You have to choose a first and a second choice. So if your second choice doesn't make it through, then it's just thrown away. And like half of people's second choices don't make it through to the second round. So you just you, yeah. you have to guess who you think is going to get through to the second round. And half of people get it wrong. I mean, it, it, it's a bizarre kind of halfway house between the French system and AV, yeah, yeah. which kind of has all of the benefits of none and all of the yeah, downsides yeah. of most. <laughs> but still better than first past the post. St- uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, anything's better than first past the post, apart from, you know lunatic in a box yeah. and he, I mean even then you know <laughs> random chance probably dictates occasionally you'll get a decent government whereas we don't seem to manage it with F F P T P if I could speak <laughs> it would help I find it's alright we'll fix that in the edit yeah we'll fix that um, in the edit <laughs> yeah <laughs> see we're just it's, it's already become a, it's already become such a thing that I feel cheap saying it because I yeah, know yeah, I'm only saying it very just quickly. so it's in there <laughs> Yeah, it may come back. Who knows? So yeah, so the the French parliamentary system works by a system of kind of alliances or mini coalitions. So the presidential majority, which is uh, led by Edouard Philippe, who is the prime minister appointed by Macron, um, they won 350 seats. The major party in that coalition is in March, but there's also other parties like the Democratic Movement and a few others. Um, right. And they, so they form the government, and then the main opposition is the Parliamentary Right Coalition, of which the main party is uh, Les Republicains, uh, Sarkozy's old party. Sarkozy, uh, Fion, those kind of chaps. And they have 137, and then the French Tories, behind them... Basically. Yeah, exactly. Then behind them we have the French Socialist Party, which is possibly the most misnamed party yep. since PASOK. Um... <laughs> In exactly and they the have, same way. yes, and true to form, they have pasokified, which is a yep. beautiful new phrase in the vernacular, yeah. and dropped two hundred eighty-seven seats to forty-four. Behind them, we have Jean-Luc Mélenchon and his bunch of—I hesitate to say hard left, but slightly more left-wing socialists, shall we say? Left, not far left. Proper socialists. Yeah, they uh, managed to win seventeen seats. Yeah. I noticed they they beat the French Labour in the first round by a few hundred thousand votes. Yes, they did, actually. Yeah, you're right. I'm just looking at that now. Yeah, they beat them 11% to 9.5 and then lost in the second. Well, Mélenchon vote, uh, um, he beat Hamon in the presidential election as well. Yeah, that's true. Um, and then the communists, French communists, are up three on ten seats. Can you imagine living in a country where a communist yeah, yeah. party well, they in they 2017 win ten they seats? They just have communists floating around. <laughs> really weird <laughs> no, it's, just, it's amazing it really is quite impressive and then the Front National and their uh, allies which are the <laughs> Rassemblement Bleu Marine and Miscellaneous Far Right according to Wikipedia uh, and they're up six on uh, on eight yeah. I think they should uh, well, although they won more votes than the communists uh, 8.8% as compared to 1.2 uh, they won less seats so yeah so that's the state of play in France um, so we've gone through the numbers what do you think about Macron? he's a bit rubbish but he's not a fascist that's always good I mean yeah, yeah not a fascist is a fairly low bar to set but in these troubled times um, yeah, it's yeah. actually a bar which we have to think about uh, something I heard the, the ex-Greek finance minister Varoufakis say from when he had to negotiate with the eurozone people during the uh, the greek bailout negotiations was that macron was one of the ones that he liked talking to the most because he wasn't they don't share politics but he at least sort of he was acting rationally so he was he was on board with the idea that there should be a bailout for mm. greece and that they should try and get uh, it out of the sort of debt rut that it had at the time and so that have quite a lot of its debt written off so that it can get its economy back on its feet and then probably be able to pay the banks back more in the long term um so sort of he was at least acting in a in a sort of rational self-interest way that you can that you can have a conversation with as opposed to what a lot of the other eurozone people uh, were doing which was um something along the lines of we just need to put down this 
revolt that's happened in Greece against the previous order. Yeah, yeah. Which again, it's a low bar to set. You know, a basic standard and, of and of different politics work as well. with people from other countries. Come up but with a deal that works for both of you. It, and of different politics. Yes, but I mean, it is, I suppose, yes. which is relevant for Britain. Encouraging. We're going to have to do that uh, very soon. That is we're, the case. We're going through negotiations with a with a yeah, with a exactly. block that France exactly. is very powerful in as well. A lot of people in in the media um, have been kind of portraying like a, a Macron Merkel axis, right? Um, forming, kind of portraying them as hmm. as sort of natural allies within the European scene uh, diplomatically. I, f- I find that interesting because as far as I can see, they don't, I mean, their politics are very, you know, not not completely in- incompatible, but they are quite different. I mean, Merkel is a member of the Christian centre-right and Emmanuel Macron is a kind of radical liberal, almost yeah, libertarian like the same on economics. Um... No, so it's 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 interesting that, at least in the judgment of, you know, the BBC and the Guardian and things like that, um, that they they seem to be forming a kind of I had to use the word again with, with reference to Germany, but a kind of axis at the centre of got Europe. That. I didn't pick up on it the first um, time you said it. <laughs> Well, I mean, when the first time I said it, it wasn't. It, it was genuinely wasn't intended as as, 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 as a, as a joke. Actually. But I mean, it, it is an unfortunate term to use. I realise with hindsight. But um, but that's. I mean, I can't think of any other word for it. Well, I'm, I'm really sorry, but it's it's like a. <laughs> perhaps yes, <laughs> but yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. It, it's an interesting um, development. I think there's a. I suppose there's an angle on it that I'm surprised, given that. Given that Merkel and the British Conservatives are more like, are more alike to one another than either of them are to the Macron type of politician, it's surprising that, uh, uh, perhaps before the referendum it would have made more sense, but it's kind of surprising that the British Conservatives don't work more closely with the Christian Democrats in Germany. Given how strong the Christian Democrats are in Germany, you'd think that other European centre right parties would want to associate themselves with them as much as possible. In Britain, they don't seem to very much at all. But that's Cameron's fault, isn't it? Because he pulled them out of the um, the main centre right block in the European Parliament. Um, because it was it was a a sop to yeah, uh, yeah. the Brexiteer tendency, which even then was strong within the Tories. Because obviously he he beat David Davis on in the second round of the of the Tory leadership contest. Um, and obviously Davis being a, a fairly fairly hard hard Brexiteer. Um, yeah, yeah. Using that term slightly anachronistically, but yeah, he he's always for the for anti EU. So so that was really a tactical yeah, point yeah, well, to consolidate his hold on the Tory party. But yeah, I mean, it has. That's right. The, um, the British Conservatives have this divide inside them between people who are very much pro Remain, um, which was the Cameron clique was very much pro Remain, the the, uh, the George Osborne types and the whatever, and the people who always yeah. wanted Brexit. They don't really have that in European yeah. Conservative parties, European centre-right Conservative parties like the Christian Democrats in Germany. They're just pro-EU straight down the line. No. Um, so I yes. suppose yeah. the British Conservatives are a different kind of party to other European centre-right parties because they have this strain yeah. uh, on their right flank that other European parties don't really have. Or If it shows up in European politics, it's entirely in a separate party rather than having... We have a UKIP, but we have a anti-EU yeah. conservative bit as well. And 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 because of that, we don't really have a UKIP anymore. You know, the the collapse the collapse of UKIP between twenty fifteen and twenty seventeen general elections is directly caused by the 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 power grab within the Tory Party mm. of that Eurosceptic Brexiteer wing. Um, so now, really, what would be the Eurosceptic Party, the the AFD, if you like, in Germany? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is subsumed within the Tory party as the Tory right. Even when UKIP were doing quite well, that was kind of the case, because they had two MPs at their peak, and both of them were defected yeah. Tories. And I think that's probably a reason um, that that while UKIP did well, um, there was always a ceiling on, on the support they were likely to get and the seats they were likely to take, because enough right-wing Eurosceptics would have still voted Tory because they lived in seats which were represented by a right-wing Tory Eurosceptic. 
Whereas if you lived in France or Germany and you are a right wing Eurosceptic, you kind of forced to vote for the insurgent party because the the main centre right grouping is is pro EU. But I, I just I just quickly um want to talk about the the ideology again of the party and of Macron. And really the party is mm. an extended presidential campaign for Macron. Um I mean, they didn't exist a couple of years ago, and now they have, as I say, three hundred and eight seats. A parliament in of five hundred and seventy-seven seats. The parliament, and so that's a another lot. And another forty-two allies. Yeah, exactly. And it it really is quite quite amazing. The next biggest party only has one hundred and twelve. It's three hundred and eight to one hundred and twelve. It's quite a lot. Yeah. But yeah, it's just to, just to quickly talk about the uh, the ideology of yeah, the party. Yeah, because they come from nowhere. I don't really know that much about. And them. and also. So they, the, yeah, I mean, it's it's very difficult to pin down anything about them because, well, the, essentially, their constituency uh, candidates are drawn more or less just from whoever wanted to sign up. I mean, they about half have never held office oh, before, um, which is interesting. Uh, not mm-hmm. necessarily a good or bad thing, just interesting. All oh, right. Half of them are women, which is great. You know, that's what we want to see. Um, but basically, the only disqualification was that you had to leave your previous political party, although that requirement right. was waived on the fifth of May, and also mm-hmm. that you couldn't have a criminal record. That was pretty much it. And there were fifteen thousand applications. That'll be interesting to see sort of what their voting record turns out being then. Because they could be quite a diverse bunch if they're just coming from yeah. all over the place. Well, this is it. This is what I imagine will happen. I mean, the the, the party itself talks about being a, like bridging the left and the right. Um, we've heard all that before. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they've already been associated with the third way, which <clears throat> it just makes me shiver. I mean, it's really interesting to me that yeah, what well, you get, you get, you get Blair Clinton. It's really interesting to me that the original yeah, yeah. meaning of third way was fascism. It was first used by Mussolini to describe fascism, and I, you know, don't want to call certain people fascist. They certainly have an authoritarian streak, <clears throat> Tony. Which, which I, I don't, I don't want to say. There's a link there, I, you know. But um, yeah, he should be tried for war crimes. There might be a sort of um, uh, a sort of a kind of a link in the sense of if you try to break down really fundamental things about the way politics works if you try and move beyond concepts that are well established like left and right you have to be very careful that you don't end up uh sort of come yeah coming up with some kind of grotesque breaking down the whole system politics yeah yeah i I agree um and i think in the same in very different ways both Mm -hmm. Mussolini and blair manage that but yeah so they they talk about being a progressive party of both the left and the right but i think I think they're broadly socially liberal, which is good, but I mean, the economics really worries me. Their financial director is a guy called Christian Dagnat, who is the former director of BNP Paribas Asset Management. Um, so this is this is a main fundraising group, and so they've got big they've money had, behind them. Yeah, well, big financial expertise at any rate, and they have between four and five million euros in donation by December 2016. By March, nine million euros. Now the average is two hundred fifty-seven, so we're talking like a, a medium at least donor is affluent, yeah, but yeah. not necessarily. But it's not it's not a Bernie rich. Sanders twenty-seven dollars at a time type thing. No, and six hundred right. donors made up half of the total. Um, so there are a decent number of extremely wealthy people who are backing this, um, and you can. I think you could. It, it still more or less holds true that you can tell quite a lot about a political party yeah. by who are its main backers. And so we are talking a socially liberal, but economically pretty radically mm-hmm. neoliberal, I would say, party backed by the middle class and the and the upper middle class. Yeah, it's interesting just how many of um, Theon's voters that uh, that Macron took in the second round. There's one more point, which is that it's got a much, much lower turnout than the presidential election. The presidential election was in the right. Yes, the okay. first round seen that. had a turnout of seventy-eight percent, and the second round had a turnout of seventy-five percent. Right. Whereas the legislative elections turnout, both rounds okay. were in the forties. That is quite significant. That's a very big drop. 
So that's a bit more like what they have in America, where people vote for president, but they don't vote for Congress. Right, so moving on from the French election, I want to briefly touch on two of the sort of tragic events yeah. that have happened since we last spoke, which is the disaster at the Grenfell Tower in Kensington and Chelsea, and the uh, terrorist attack at hmm. Finsbury Park Mosque in Islington. I don't want to dwell too much on this because in both situations, you know, things are ongoing. There's yeah, people yeah. looking into it and you know, it's such a terrible you know, they're both such terrible tragedies. Um I mean seventy nine people mm. have now died in the Grenfell Fire and that's only likely to rise because bodies are constantly being found and they may never identify them all. And the the Finsbury Park attack again, one death, eleven injured, kind of continuing the back and forth um violence between well not between but of both the Islamist extremist groups and lone actors and far right extremists against the innocent people of yes. the UK seemingly without any kind of sense. Well very effectively what um what people call radical Islam is essentially the Islamic far right. It's the it's the yeah, analogue of the far yeah, right in Islamic co- uh, sort of societies and groups and communities and whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's it's different sections of the Brit- of British society having their own versions of the far right just attacking the general Christopher population. Christopher used to call them Ila- Islamo fascism. I can kind of see why he did that, but I'm not quite sure if it's if it's specifically fascism. It's only far right, but it, no, but fascism something yes. quite particular. Yeah, indeed. I I I wouldn't use the term myself, but um, it's what I think it's. It speaks to that analog, as you say, that these are radical elements of. In the same way that um, uh, what they had in Japan during the Second World War wasn't really fascism, but it sort of yeah, had and some enough similarities, similarities that they were able to cooperate. Whereas, of course, these two forces are kind of implacably opposed, although they feed off each other. Very much so. The more attacks there are by. Islamic far right, as you say, extremists. Mm. The more attacks there will be by Christian far right extremists, or as it may turn out, just generally um, kind of fascist inspired. Uh, I don't know. Again, it's too early to say the precise motivation of uh, the guy Darren Osborne who attacked uh, the congregation as they were leaving the Finsbury Park mm. Mosque, but. He's uh, supposed to be linked with Britain First, at least. Right, yeah. As a Protestant, ex- d- uh, derives from Protestant extremist Orange Order movements in Northern Ireland, which may become relevant yes. shortly. And um, I would be very surprised if he wasn't at least, if, if he didn't at least follow Britain First. Like, yeah, um, exactly. Sort of pay attention to the media that they put out and, and listen in much to their the stuff same way that a lot of the, I don't know, I'm not sure about the Manchester bomber, but certainly um, the the attacks, the attack in Westminster um, earlier, uh, be, be, hmm. before the, the latest, he was not certainly not you know formally organisationally linked with. Uh, Daesh or or Al Qaeda or any other organization of that nature, but was caught up in that general um, kind of predominantly online um, sort of those kind of circles of yeah. He would have listened to the same radical preachers, read the same radical literature. And it, it does definitely whatever. seem that both the the Islamic far right and the and the and the Christian far right seem to be operating through similar organizational um and and uh methods in in how they radicalize yeah but um i've always had this kind of problem with um people always call it radical islam but i don't think that's specific enough because you can be radical in all kinds of directions it's very very radical to be a muslim and support the idea of liberal democracy if you live in saudi arabia so they are a radical muslim but it's just a very particular kind of radical islam and and they will yes if you're a devout Muslim and you believe in liberalism and democracy, you're very likely to think that there's a 
there's a connection between those two things. Your religion and your politics are going to be part of the same worldview. Mm. So to you, you're going to think that Islam and liberalism imply one another in your own head. That's part of your worldview. So from your perspective, radical Islam means supporting the equality of all people and uh, self-government and whatever. So it's specifically radically far-right Islam rather than just radical and the, and Islam. And the specific brand of, of ultra-Sunnism which derives from uh, the, Wah- the Wahhabi yes. movement. Uh, they, like to, they like to call themselves the Salafi, but I don't think you'll mm-hmm. find them with that. Yeah, so also in Iran, they have what you could you could arguably call it far-right, the kind of government that they have in Iran, or at least some of the factions in the government that they have in Iran. But it's a very different kind of thing from, from what ISIS are. So they're both mm. sort of... You could call them both parts of the Islamic far-right, but they're but very different on, ideologies. You know, completely different interpretations of, of the yeah, yeah, yeah. different well, schools hate each of, other. Of, of Sharia law. Yeah, I mean, test one another, of course. Um, and then also, as I say, the as well as the the terrorist attack, there's been the the Grenfell Tower fire, which seems to at this point the inquiry has been announced, but has yet to, you know take place. But it seems at this point that it was pretty likely that the fire was able to spread so quickly because of inferior quality cladding, hmm. which was applied to the outside of the tower um supposedly to make it look prettier for the richer uh, residents nearby um and that the basically the, the the um the people who own the tower or the people that uh the refurbish the tower rather used poor quality um aluminium cladding with a kind of plastic backing which enabled the fire to right. quickly spread up the side um there were also no sprinkler systems no fire alarms or at least insufficient points which the residents have brought up again and again with the council and kind of just ignored or in some cases directly told Mm. to shut up and branded as troublemakers and it also seems that uh, the new chief of staff, Theresa May who was previously a housing minister sat on a report, didn't release a report conducted by his department which potentially would have called attention to the problems in not just this tower block but others elsewhere in Mm. london particularly and could possibly have prevented this from happening had it been released when it was drafted last year so a massive failure on behalf of the Mm. council the central government and corporations involved there's been a lot of people saying things like it's really important not to politicize this but That tends to... I I think that assumes that... That's an outgrowth of the fact that people aren't used to politics being able to help people anymore. If politics can't deal with stuff like this, if this kind of thing isn't political, then what's politics for? If it can't help people... And I, and I, and I, I think completely the opposite. I think that we absolutely must politicize Mm. this. That it is absolutely necessary that we that we politicize this disaster because this disaster epitomizes the neglect of working class people in london and across the country it epitomizes the 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 lack of care that corporations show towards the uh people who you know happen to be poor Mm. um and the the neglect that the government's shown um because this this is the kind of thing that could have been looked into was looked into mm. and nothing was done about it and concerns were raised and nothing was done about it there's an article in the guardian uh by david lammy mp who uh is not the mp for that constituency i don't think although he may be i'm not entirely sure but i don't think so but he knew someone who died in the fire uh no yeah he's, he's the mp for tottenham but he knew someone who died in the fire and he essentially says that this was corporate manslaughter and they have to be arrests wow and and i agree you know the the police have said that they are looking into it and that they will bring charges if they find evidence to suggest that uh, there was corporate negligence and i think charges of corporate manslaughter you know if enough evidence is found should definitely no, be it's brought. entirely plausible people, some you know 
yeah and pe- people have to have to the people in power who should could have and should have done something about this have to be made to answer for their errors and for their neglect yeah. and i think it is likely that the police will find evidence of criminal yeah. neglect and i hope that they do if you happen charged. to be powerful enough that your action that you can be very far removed from the consequences of your actions that doesn't make them any less your fault no no and as i say people knew about this this was these these concerns were raised nothing was done and 79 people and rising mm. are dead and yeah we do have to politicize it absolutely absolutely must mm. politicize it because this is an example of everything that tory politics does not do for the people yeah. of this country. It's, it's not a matter of because it's a very, very serious situation, therefore it can't be political. Politics isn't supposed to be low stakes, nothing really matters. No. It, this, in situations when it's really, really seriously affecting people's lives and ending people's lives, that doesn't yeah. make it less political, it makes it more political. No, and it's a failure of the political um, level of political discourse in this country, exacerbated by the media, the obsession with horse race politics mm. and with um, this idea of electability uh, being the only thing that matters in politics. And, you know, it's it's the kind of stuff that political junkies get off on, and I must admit to being one of them, but we cannot let that... Um, obscure the real important issues underlying politics which is what politics is and should be about and I think there was an article in the New Statesman um, which I will try and find for the show notes which was essentially saying that this is the kind of the the Clinton Blair um, grand master stroke was to pull the wool over the country's eyes of the fact that politics could matter and reduce it to a kind of crass managerialism yeah, yeah. and reduce the media's focus on politics to to just yeah, this weird idea of electability and Jeremy Corbyn's unelectable, therefore he's not relevant, mm. and not looking at actually his policies, and it's the same thing here, that that we have to focus on these issues because they are, the, what or should be, the drivers of politics mm-hmm. Yeah, you get this you get this with all kinds of issues exactly. where people think pe- people, if an issue affects someone's life, they're very likely to know a lot about it and they'll have all kinds of ideas about how it could be done better or whatever. But very rarely do people make the link that it's that, that could have something to do with politics and that you could vote in such a way as to bring about the changes that they yeah. think are that, that they think are needed. Because politics so rarely actually affects their lives directly in the way that it should. So people think that when something very serious happens, that shouldn't be political because they're not used to politics mattering. Politics and because to them to politics means yeah and because to them politics means the spin and the mudslinging and Jeremy Corbyn didn't sing the national anthem or oh look at Gordon Brown hasn't he got mm. a funny eye all this kind of nonsense which just doesn't matter it's about the principles and the ideas and the policies and the events dear boy mm. and people yeah. know that people and hate the the, the nonsense talking in the media yeah. and they want people but to they talk think about that is politics I think this is the problem that, that because the media's presented politics in this way to most people politics means that yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean real things you know and it's much easier to control people and as I said the article like that, that. that I said I was uh, about in the New Statesman was saying that maybe this disaster will have the silver lining that it might burst that bubble and it might break that um Hold over politics in in or the discussion of politics. I really hope it does. Really hope it does. Now to turn to the uh, meaningless uh, horse race uh, political joke <laughs> media coverage nonsense, um, which yeah does need to happen because this actually in in this. In the aftermath of this election, that stuff actually will matter yes. very much. So this is, of course, the fallout from the United Kingdom general election 2017, which has happened in the meantime since we last spoke. Yes, yes. How are you feeling? How are you feeling about the results? Well, um, 
far, far better than I thought I would this time a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> we we watched much of the election together. Yes, we did. Um, uh, you you disappeared off a part way through the night, whereas I I stay to the end. Yes. I did stay up uh, all the night. It's just not in not yes. all in the same pub. <laughs> no, indeed. But yeah, we were we were. We were there to the end. Um, <laughs> I remember when the um, the uh, the exit poll came through. Um, uh, someone got it up on their phone and they said, "Oh, oh it's ten o'clock. The polls are closed. Exit poll comes out. Let's just get that up." Oh, ah, uh, oh, Conservatives' largest party. Hang on, largest party. That doesn't <laughs> sound like a majority. <laughs> get more detail quickly. Hung Parliament. Ah, ah, ah. What's going on? <laughs> I remember cheering at that point, and pretty much every time Labour took a seat from there on in, um, one of the most spectacular sights of the evening, I think, and I think this is after you you disappeared, was the entirety of of the pub basically giving Jeremy Corbyn's uh, victory speech in when he won. Uh, re-election to his seat of Islington North, a standing ovation in the oh, pub. Oh, brilliant! With <laughs> whooping and cheering, and then the the two Tories, one of whom was actually wearing a Conservative rosette, uh, they just sort of sat glumly in the corner, looking a bit sad. <laughs> and then the, the 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 reverse when when Theresa May won her constituency, just the chorus of boos, and then the two <laughs> the two sullen kind of voices raised in plaintive cheers. <sighs> Gotta have some kind it of was a beautiful sight to see. It was a beautiful sight to see. I, I, really, I, I almost wept. Yeah. Well, since I've been um, old enough to pay attention properly, I've had the 2015 election, the Brexit referendum, and then the US election. So it's been quite a long time mm. since I've had a major vote that hasn't gone completely against the way that I wanted it to. So it's quite, it's quite yes. nice to know what at least some of it feels like. I can't imagine what it'd be like if Labour actually wins an election. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, it, would, it wouldn't be so brilliant. So anyway, yeah, so as everyone listening to this will know by now, obviously we didn't get to do an episode last week because David was on a boat. Um, I was doing all manner but, of things. <laughs> yes, but I'm focusing on the boat. Fair enough. Because you are on a boat. <laughs> I mean, who does that? Um, not my boat, to be clear. <laughs> No, no, yes, no. We should, we should, we should emphasize. Uh, this, is, this is not a personal yeah. boat. This is a hired boat, and hired among a number of people. It was not David's. David wasn't swanning around the from the university. Southampton Harbour. The university has a boat. I had no idea. Uh, well, I didn't realize that. Isn't that a thing? I suppose it makes sense. They do oceanography. Yeah, yeah. So they must need one. But anyway, yes. So um, as everyone listening to this will know, uh, the Tories are indeed the largest party. Uh, we're not. They do not have an overall majority, which they did before. Which they did before. Uh, they had a majority of twelve, working majority of seventeen. Once you ex- uh, factor in the um, absenteeism of Sinn Fein, mm-hmm. uh, in this seat they won. Th- in this election, rather, they won three hundred and seventeen seats, which is down thirteen, and insufficient to form a majority yes. government, which is quite incredible really uh, before the election I was predicting a majority for the Tories of about 30 seats um, I can't remember whether I mentioned that on a previous episode but that's what I've definitely been saying mm-hmm. to people I was, um, I was thinking they were going to win by 30 seats which considering at the start of the campaign we were talking about 120 plus um, yeah, we were was still about a big come down the Labour Party's existence was in threat it might have its worst election yeah. since before it had ever formed a government since the 30s yeah and now exactly. it's had its best election since 2001, when Blair was at his height. Mm. Beat Blair's yeah. result in 2005. <laughs> in terms of votes. In terms of votes, yeah, yes. Unfortunately, not in terms of seats. But, you know, there's there's time yet. Yes. But yeah, I mean, so yes, Labour... So I was predicting before 30 seats for the Tories. In fact, Labour increased their vote share by 9.6%. Uh, which is quite a lot. I think I think I heard something about goes. that's the biggest swing to Labour since since nineteen forty five. 
which was when they first came to government. Considering how quite Uh, bad 2015 was. Wasn't the first first time they came to government? Oh, first time they came to majority government. Um, Yeah, yeah. They did have a minority back in the 30s. Yeah. Captain Meredith McDonald's prime minister twice. Is that oh, right? Cool? Yeah, uh, once in the twenties and then in the thirties. Yeah, fair enough. I might have to check that. It's been a while since I did into war history, but yeah, I believe they had a majority, a minority government twice before that. Oh. But yes, but yeah, but biggest swing to Labour since Attlee, who was of course the greatest prime minister this country's ever had, yep. indisputably. <laughs> and yeah, so it's it was a massive and very pleasant surprise. Unfortunately, still doesn't leave the country in a brilliant position because Labour don't have a majority even with the help of the SNP, the Liberal Democrats and Caroline Lucas as the single Green MP Hooray. and Plaid Cymru yeah, and Plaid Cymru they wouldn't have been able to form the Party of Wales, a rainbow coalition of the left so we are left with a what looks like it will be a confidence to supply agreement rather than a formal coalition, coalition of between... chaos <laughs> between Theresa May's Conservatives and the DUP um, yes the coalition of chaos as was threatened by Theresa May and delivered but not in circumstances that she possibly would have expected there are sympathisers well this is the thing so yeah a government propped up by the DUP um, hmm. a party founded um, by Ian Paisley, Reverend Ian Paisley, uh, which grew out of the um, kind of hardline Protestant church in Northern Ireland. It's worth pointing out this with links. It's worth pointing out at this at this point that Ian Paisley, um, hardline Protestant, whatever. Jeremy Corbyn campaigned for him to be released from jail during um, his campaigns to try and bring an end to the troubles. I did not know. So. That. <laughs> If he was supporting the IRA, well, by the same token, he was supporting the Protestant terrorists as well. Yeah. So he well, can't I think what possibly Jeremy Corbyn was trying to do both was, of them. Was, was end the violence um, by whatever means he yes. could and was willing to talk to terrorists to do that. But yes. Uh, so, yeah. So the DUP has the links he, with. He, he spoke um, to the Protestant terrorists as well as the IRA. So yeah. he wasn't just supporting yeah. the IRA. Anyway, yeah. that's just a side point. Oh, I didn't know that. That's, yeah. that's, that is interesting. But yeah, so the the DQ Democratic Unionist Party, the largest party in Northern Ireland, uh, as I say, was founded by Reverend Ian Paisley, and has it has links to um, union uh, unionist paramilitaries, um, particularly. Uh, third force and more importantly the Ulster resistance Hmm. Um, it kind of overtook the Ulster Unionist Party um, by 2004 which was the previous kind of main party of the Unionist right in in the same way that in the the Republican side they have the Social Democratic and Labour Party in Northern Ireland but they also have Sinn Féin Mm. which is the more yeah um, intense... Hardline nationalist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the oh, DUP yeah. are the more hardline version of the the Protestant Unionist side. Yeah. So they are the Sinn Féin's opposite number in that sense. Um, so yeah, they are opposed to abortion. They are opposed to same-sex marriage. Um, a number of their senior members are young Earth creationists who believe that the Earth is approximately six thousand years old mm, and yes. that God created it and everything on it in six days. And then rested on the Sabbath, of course. Indeed. Yes. Uh, because even God needs a sleep after a, a job like that. And, f- and fair yeah, enough. That's fair enough. That's a, that's a, that's a fair role. If, if I had created the universe, I would want a kip. I would, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so what do you think about the DUP, David? Well, you've summed up quite a lot of um, my thoughts on it just there. I mean, um, they are... A kind of conservatism that we don't associate with having in the UK. They sound like the sort of thing that we have in the mystical lands across the Atlantic in America of hardline Christians mm. that we don't put up with here. But no, we do have them in Britain, and now they are being or relied upon by the Prime Minister to give her a majority in Parliament. So yeah. that's not good. Uh, 
No. Although there is a potential advantage, which is that all the Northern Irish parties, um, <clears throat> because of their particular situation in Northern Ireland, want to avoid having a hard border with the Republic. So yes. um, they might force the Conservatives to have um, uh, less of a hard-line approach towards ending free movement of people across the EU. So they, they will soften the amount of the, the, uh, the level of Brexit that we end up happening, possibly, so that they can maintain their special arrangement with uh, the border situation in Ireland. Mm. Which the Conservatives would not have done on their own. No. Yes. So, so yeah, at this point, I, I believe we're recording this on the evening of Tuesday, the 20th of June. We are. Midsummer's Eve. And Midsummer's Eve, indeed. And at this point, I do not think a formal agreement between the Conservative Party and the DUP has yet been reached. No. The Queen's speech is due to be tomorrow. Um, which will be interesting. Which will be interesting to see. So that agreement presumably has to be hammered out tonight or early tomorrow yeah. morning, or we've got a bit of a problem. Um, so for those who don't know, the the DUP aren't doing what the Liberal Democrats did after the 2010 general election. They aren't becoming formal partners of the Conservative Party. So there won't be in a coalition. DUP ministers in the government? No. Or you know, theoretically possible, but it's very unlikely yeah. um, at this point. Um, technically, the Prime Minister is... can pick whoever she likes. but Yes. So what instead is likely to happen is a confidence of supply agreement whereby the DUP agree to support the Conservatives on votes of confidence which would essentially at this point given the modifications made by the Fixed Term Parliaments Act really be um, restricted to the Queen's speech itself and then any votes of no confidence in the government's leadership Yes. previously it would have also included other major issues of which the camp Conservatives campaigned on but that's slightly been put to bed by the Fixed Term Parliaments Act mm -hmm. slightly um, and then supply, meaning the budget, essentially. And it would be the autumn statement, except that's been got rid of. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, money and Queen's speech is pretty much it. And the very, very confidence. basics that you need to even be a government. Yes, exactly. Um, every other bill the Conservatives want to put through, they're going to have to put through on a bill by bill basis and to, mm. they're going to have to win the support of the DUP on a bill by bill basis which is going to make governing incredibly difficult yes um, you know, it probably won't cause too many trouble with the um, the problematic social positions that the DUP takes on a lot of things on, on LGBT rights and whatever because the Conservatives will be able to get support from opposition parties on those sorts of things that's true and also I think the DUP are clever enough to strategically not try and um, affect the situation for abortion and same-sex marriage and so on, yeah, on yeah, yeah. in Britain as long as they can keep their exemption for Northern Ireland um, because I think you know the Nigel Dodds and, and people like that have been triangulating in, in Northern Ireland for a long time they're kind of adept at that kind of um, negotiation I don't think they would be so foolish as to try and force those issues yes Anyway, voting still as, very, very sectarian in Northern Ireland. If you're mm. from a um, a Catholic community, you're very unlikely to be voting for the DUP at any point. So there yeah. are large sections of the population that the DUP are never going to win over. It's not like a normal election. They need to win. That their electorate that they're targeting is not the electorate of the whole of Northern Ireland. It's a subset of the electorate of Northern Ireland because about a third of the population will never vote for them anyway. Exactly. But yeah, so um, so I think we are we are probably safe on abortion and same sex marriage as far as the mainland Britain is concerned. Obviously, it's still a massive problem that these things aren't ex extended to Northern Ireland. Um, things, uh, abortion rights in particular, because it's just simply too expensive for women to get abortions in in Britain. Because not only do they have to pay for passage, but also because NHS hospitals won't provide abortions mm -hmm. to Northern Irish women um, as a kind of another. Sop to the to the DUP. Um, What's it like in the Republic? Can they cross the border? I, I don't know what the situation in the Republic, but I think their abortion rules are quite restrictive as well. I think I they are yeah. as restrictive. But yeah, so because because of that, um, they would also have to pay for private healthcare, which just you know runs into the 
thousands of pounds yeah, yeah. it's just not viable for all but the richest and northern um, ireland's one of the poorest areas of the uk so well exactly so that's very bad but anyway uh returning to kind of parliamentary arithmetic yes. as you said before what it does mean is that hard brexit uh in the theresa may style or the style that she was kind of proclaiming hmm. bear in mind she campaigned for remain but <laughs> yeah. the style that she was going for before the last that's election remember it. um it is always um but yeah that is unlikely to happen in quite the same way now yeah 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 very much so and she's Um, going to have to listen to the opposition parties to the lib dems to labor to the smp mm. much more in order to get things through parliament and also any situation where she doesn't where she can't rely on the dup she'll have to be relying on other parties Mm. and it isn't just the dup as well because of course there are now 13 scottish conservatives who owe essentially their seats to the success uh, of Ruth Davidson, the Scottish Conservative leader, who is an incredibly formidable campaigner. Mad. And on well, on my list of the five Tories, I have some degree of respect yeah, for. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, it would have, would have been... But no, of course not. But it would have been nice <laughs> if she won less seats for the reason yeah, yeah. that it would have deprived the Tories of even the ability to form a minority government. But the fact that she has 13 means that her MPs who are from the more liberal and also the more or the less Eurosceptic wing of the Tory party will also be able to um, overturn Theresa May's majority whenever they feel like it. Mm-hmm. So that uh, provides another lock on things like LGBT rights, bear in mind, particularly that Ruth Davidson is herself gay. Um, but also, I think, more generally, uh, issues of, of civil liberties, Human Rights Act, if that comes up. And I think uh, anything to do with, with Brexit Theresa May or whoever is Prime Minister by then um, will have to be very careful with how they play the Scottish Tories. Yeah, yeah. Because it's entirely possible that Ruth Davidson could just walk away and form her own Scottish Conservative Party, which has been rumoured. Oh, that's been rumoured, has it? I've, I, yeah, I mean, it is just rumoured. I can see why but... people would speculate uh, from the outside because yes. she probably could. She probably does have the political sort yeah. of uh, um, weight to do it. But and I don't think she would. Yeah, I don't know if she's made she any wouldn't. moves uh, suggesting no. that she actually wants to do it at all. But the threat of it is a very, very big um, weapon in her arsenal. Yes. And it wouldn't surprise me if those rumours may have originated somewhere close to Ruth Davidson herself. Yes. Even if she had no intention of actually were... doing it, it was just to uh, yes, just to uh, to flex her muscles to make sure that people know that she has to be listened to by Conservative Party HQ now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In much the same way that um, Kessia Dugdale was was flexing her muscles in the last Parliament um, for independent, more autonomy for the Scottish Labour Party. Right. Yes. Um. So yeah. So that's kind of the situation post election. Do you have any more thoughts on 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 what the likely kind of future is to be? What What do you think is going to happen to Theresa May, for instance? Well, uh, the old phrase of how the Conservative Party handles its leadership is its absolute monarchy regulated by regicide. Mm. So Conservatives will completely get behind their leader, just like they did when she first got elected, because she didn't even go to the membership of the Conservative Party. She was effectively just chosen by the MPs. Um, But pretty much all the Conservative members didn't make too much of a fuss about it. They weren't that bothered because Conservatives are very good at getting behind the leader. But as soon as they smell weakness on the leader, they don't stand for it for very long. So Mm. she's made quite a few major unforced errors just recently, and it's lost them their majority. And I can't see a Conservative Party that very, very recently was looking like it was going to be unquestionably in government for a long time, putting up with that for very long. It would require some kind of big dog in the party to make a proper run at the leadership maybe Boris or something like that Um, they need something to sort of get behind but I would not be surprised if there is a large appetite for getting rid of Theresa May in the senior parts of the Conservative Party and of course what often happens in these situations is that we have the Heseltine doctrine which states that the one who uh, fires a starting gun on a leadership contest tends not to get the crown yes that was exactly the same and, with the coup in the Labour Party. Um, yeah. Uh, well, well, 
Jeremy Corbyn won it, the, the leadership election, but mm. even the main challenger wasn't the person who actually challenged him for the leadership. Exactly. Who, who was it originally? And, uh, it was Angela, Angela Eagle, Eagle yeah. came Owen Smith. But it was Owen Smith after a while. Yeah. And I, I think I think that would it would probably be the situation if um, for example Boris Johnson were to challenge for the leadership uh, of course we know his, he has his eyes on the prime ministership and always has but I think there is enough bad feeling for him within the parliamentary party if not in the grassroots that's quite very like true him, but he, I think he... the parliamentary party would probably stop him before he got to the final two he does have significant enemies um, yeah I think it's, it's easy to underestimate just how popular he is in the country, though. A lot of people like him. Oh, so yeah, definitely. If he did become leader, the Tory party would be quite formidable. If he, if he got through to the top two, then I think he'd win. Yeah, the yeah. Membership. But I just don't know if the Tory party would let him. I mean, they didn't last time. That's very um, true. Go, they gove knifed him last time. Someone mm. else might this time. I mean, David Davis's name has been floating around as the, as the sort of oh, front God. runner for the succession. Um, which... I don't know. I mean, it'd be better than Boris, but not by a massive deal. Would it be significantly better for May from the Conservatives' perspective? It is, it is, maybe, maybe just fresh face, I suppose. I think. Very I think that's really it. I think that's really it at this yeah. point. I mean, also he he kind of he is involved in Brexit, which is important. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the moment, because the 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 Eurosceptic, the hardline Eurosceptic, Brexiteer wing of the Tory Party is their best organised. But yeah, I think it's not certainly not impossible and in fact not not um not unlikely that Boris Johnson could act as a stalking horse to then but that would then open up the leadership to Davis and possibly Philip Hammond has also been mooted yeah yeah that's possible I think that could well happen um I honestly think that the biggest thing protecting Theresa May at the moment is that is Brexit and the fact that if yeah, Brexit yeah. goes badly which it probably will to one extent or another I mean either it's pretty much an impossible balancing act no one can get yeah. this really right yeah either she gets a really hard Brexit and screws the country which will become apparent fairly quickly I think or she doesn't and she goes for a soft Brexit in which case she will really 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 wind up the toy right and possibly cause a resurgence of UKIP which again doesn't look great for her yeah. She might have gotten away with it if she'd come out for a soft Brexit straight away. Yeah. Um, but because she's been spinning this hard Brexit thing, if she then backs away from it, um, uh, she won't be able to control what happens next. There will just be a terrible yeah, backlash. Think, and I think she's just going to look like a, like a traitor to the cause. Yeah, yeah. And so, But I think the thing keeping her in power more than anything else is the fact that no one wants her job because no one yeah, wants to be yeah. the Tory Prime Minister who either screwed over the country by pushing through a hard Brexit that we didn't really have the mandate for, given that the referendum was only, you know, only four points in it. Mm -hmm. Or is the Prime Minister who splits the Tory party on the issue of Europe again possibly fatal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean... Because they thought very, very recently, until very recently, the Tories thought, oh good, we've we finally put to bed that issue of, of what yeah. do we do about Europe? That, that running saw that's always caused the Conservatives trouble. Nope, <laughs> not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh I which does? Something then. Yeah, I've well, forgotten you... it. <laughs> well, there we are. Which does segue rather neatly into our final item uh, yes. on the agenda, which is the Brexit negotiations, which have begun. They began yesterday on the nineteenth of June, hmm. and um, the. David Davis, who is the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union and is leading Britain's team in these negotiations, said that his primary aim for the summer was to agree the timetable for negotiations. In particular, to ensure that um, essentially the, the terms of the, if you like, the divorce settlement would be negotiated alongside the terms of any future trade deal. Right, yes. Michael Barnier, the EU lead negotiator, has turned around and basically told him flat, that ain't happening, son. Yes. And Davis has backed down in one day when he said he would he would he was happy to fight all summer for this. 
and he's back he back down in one day so the idea being that davis wants to have them agreed at the same time so that britain isn't yeah. left with a solid plan for how you get out of the eu but absolutely no plan for what your future relationship with the eu is once you're out so that the exactly. eu can't leave us hanging yeah and the eu want to be able to leave us hanging so that they have a stronger hand in the in the negotiations for our future relationship when they happen yeah and in particular they have divided the um now that they've had the the kind of opening talks um they've divided into three work groups um three main work groups which are focused on a the size of the financial settlement that the uk pays to the eu right um as part of honoring agreements already made whilst a member b the rights of eu citizens within um the united kingdom and of uk citizens within the other eu countries mm-hmm. and c and possibly most importantly in a lot of ways um the northern irish border um borders more generally is the the title of the work group but i mean there's only one and <laughs> it is and it is the border between the northern ireland and the republic of ireland which that's going to be gnarly that issue it really is and until those three issues but Barney I didn't say not not necessarily until they've been finalised but until he is satisfied that significant enough progress has been made on all three of those issues any talks about trade will not happen right which is an incredibly strong position for the EU to be in because those issues are vitally important but very very complicated yeah yeah uh, in particular Northern Ireland yeah, well, the the easy way to solve the Northern Irish situation will be to keep free movement of people. Yes, but both the Conservative Party and, in fact, Labour have rejected that. Yes, yeah, and I can see both why. To be honest with you, I can I yeah. can see why the um, a very very large part of the reason why people voted Leave was because they wanted something done about immigration. Yeah, and if nothing changes on immigration people aren't going to be happy about that there's going to be big problems yeah. um, and UKIP are going to come back in a big way yeah, yeah. And, and and whilst I don't agree that we should end free movement I think free movement is good I, I think all the indicators are that immigration on average is beneficial to the economy mm-hmm. and more the point it just people should be able to travel and live where they want it's yeah. just well there's a certain amount should. of the the left principle isn't free movement it's open borders and that has to yes. be that has to be worldwide and so the idea is open borders way off in the future when we can achieve it is the sort of it's the the ideal goal and Agreed. having but free movement th- of people in a block of very rich countries that then have very restrictive immigration rules for everyone outside of those isn't pro- probably isn't going to be a step on the road towards the thing that the left wants so I, I think it, you could, I could very easily see the left getting behind ending free movement, but overall, so introducing some controls on EU immigration, but relaxing our very, very strict outside of the EU immigration, such that we have a much more uniform um, uh, uh, immigration system, but which is overall less restrictive. So that would mean we, we don't have open borders at all anywhere but overall we actually have a more free immigration system I see that argument and which is more in line with the left principle of open borders worldwide yeah and I think that's kind of what Jeremy Corbyn is moving towards yeah. but I think it's also partially a triangulation uh, on the issue to kind of knock it on the head as an electoral problem yeah, yeah, which yeah. it definitely was in 2015 uh, and it seems to have worked because immigration didn't come up that all that much in the 2017 campaign Mm -hmm. when it was a massive component of the 2015 campaign but i respectfully disagree i think free movement within the eu is a potential um step on the road towards a wider open border in the same way that i think the eu itself is a potential um step on the road on the road towards greater international cooperation uh, I, I do agree now, I would, I would I th- rather keep free movement of people um, yeah, but given yeah. that there's no consent for it in the UK at the moment 
Um, yeah, I can see how you could end free movement of people, but still be moving in a direction that makes our immigration system more in line with the left principle. In theory, yeah, in theory, but with a Tory, yep. Well, I mean, oh no, that definitely <laughs> won't happen with a Tory government. If but, we re- um, if we retain a Tory government, that's not. There's no way that's going to happen. But yeah, I mean, I, I I do I do see the point that having um, the EU as a block, which is free within but has very very hard border fortress europe as they call it mm. on the outside is 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 a bad situation both for you know kind of immigration particularly refugee um access but also for trade i mean it allows basically the eu to set ridiculously high prices which disadvantage poor mm. countries mainly in africa and and um and southern asia which which is a huge problem of, of the eu and one of the reasons why I don't really like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I like I like it better than the alternative, yes. which is massively increased integration with the with North America. And yeah, yeah. Re- I I don't like the EU, but I think that retreating into the idea of a of a, a, a sort of atomized nation states in Europe that only interact with each other on sort of bilateral bases, just like we interact with Mexico, isn't the way to yeah. go in a way that you organized Europe either. There needs to be some kind no. of, um, of of way that Europe organizes itself that is above the nation state, but I don't like the EU. Well, I don't like what the EU has has, has become. Actually. Yeah, the, um, the current EU, the EU that we have. Yeah, I think the original ideas were good. Um, and Varoufakis's kind of plans for reform are very interesting with his uh, Democracy in Europe movement. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think they'll be realised. Yeah, but... the the branch of the uh, democracy in Europe movement that was in well, it, it the democracy in Europe movement during the referendum campaign launched a Britain specific bit to try and uh, mm. campaign for remain in the EU, but that was independent of the the official in campaign. Um, yeah, and and Corbyn sort of walked a line between those two campaigns, not properly going in for the official uh, remain campaign, but sort of also being involved with this. I think it was called Another Europe is Possible. Which is definitely the position I think I take, yes, and yeah. I think probably the position he would take. And that that was kind because of the uh, the source of the he wasn't very enthusiastic about Remain. It's because yeah, he didn't he was didn't go all in in the in in the normal way where he just supported the the in campaign that David Cameron was on, uh, because he was sort of trying to juggle, sort of supporting that because he did support Remain and he was a major party leader, but trying to remain independent and arguing for remain in a very different way to what the official campaign was arguing for remain for and so that that, and, that and, can and, look and, like being unenthusiastic about it and trying to stick to his to his principles because he, he has long been an opponent of of what was then the EA and became the EU yeah. because of its fundamental basis in right wing neoliberal yeah, and rightly economics yeah indeed um, Although I think not quite as strongly as Tony Benn was. Tony Benn was completely against. It was, he just wanted just oh, to leave yeah, straight yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Tony Benn was. And Tony Benn was also um, a proponent of, you know, the kind of theory that Labour, even under Blair, was still the best vehicle for advancing socialism in the country, and that if so, if you were a socialist, you should join Labour and try and move it to the left and the inside yeah, yeah. rather than supporting the Greens or, or, or the SWP or any group like that. Hmm. And I suppose with what's happened recently with Corbyn he has sort of been it, posthumously been vindicated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily proved right but had quite a lot of evidence piled on his side of the argument. Yeah and, and touch word will be proved right properly yes, very yeah, soon. Yeah. So yeah so I mean I think I mean that's that's kind of the main uh, issues of the day. Hmm. Anything more you have to say to the listeners? No, no, I don't know really. We've been going yeah. for about an hour and a half, which is about what we did last time. We have, and it's, and it's been a bit a bit of a, a, a rush job yeah, this yeah. time around, so I do apologise. But uh, next next time, I'll have better equipment at hand. Yes, and your two hosts are recording from several miles apart at the moment. Not only that, I mean that's we're just not shouting very problem, loud. Right? We're still using the same mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, but it's yeah, it's yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, 
We'll fix this in the edit. We'll fix this in the edit. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Well, if that's everything, David. I think so. Um, thank you very much, comrades, for your time and attention. You've been listening to Revolutionary Dispatches. Viva la Revolution. There's a dog barking now.